Hyperglycemia is a common problem in hospitalized patients. Often, the medications they are on cause high blood sugars, as does the stress of being ill. A number of studies have looked at the benefits of glucose control in hospitalized patients, and most have shown that blood sugars between 140 to 180 are optimal to prevent adverse outcomes from hyperglycemia, as well as avoiding severe hypoglycemia. For patients with diabetes, often their oral medications are held on admission to the hospital. Metformin can be unsafe in situations of changing renal function. Sulfonylureas can cause hypoglycemia if patients are not eating their usual diet. SGLT2 inhibitors should be avoided in critical illness due to the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists are likely safe to continue. If home medications are stopped, they should be restarted one to two days prior to discharge if possible to allow for any necessary adjustments prior to the patient returning home. For most patients with diabetes though, they're best managed with insulin during their hospitalization. While hospitalized, frequent glucose monitoring is important, especially if home medications have been stopped. For patients who are eating, blood sugars should be checked before every meal. If not eating, they should be checked every four to six hours. If blood sugars are over 180 milligrams per deciliter, insulin should be started with a goal to maintain blood sugars for most patients between 140 and 180. How to dose insulin depends on how sick the patient is. For those who are critically ill, the best option is IV insulin. Most hospitals have a protocol for adjusting insulin drip rates based on hourly blood sugars, and this is the safest option for critically ill patients, as well as those with markedly elevated blood sugars. As patients improve, they can be transitioned from IV insulin to subcutaneous insulin. To do this, you calculate the total daily insulin dose given IV over the previous 24 hours, and you can give 60 to 80% of this as basal insulin, and add prandial insulin as the patient's food intake improves. It's important to give the basal insulin two hours prior to discontinuing the IV insulin, as the effect of IV insulin will wear off quickly, but it'll take several hours for the long-acting insulin to be effective. Non-critically ill patients who are not eating can be managed with basal insulin. If they're on insulin at home, it's appropriate to start with their home dose. If not previously on insulin, it's reasonable to start at 10 units for most patients. If patients are eating and blood sugars are consistently elevated on basal insulin alone, they should be given both basal and mealtime insulin. With the total daily dose of insulin about 0.3 units per kilogram, half given as basal and half given as mealtime insulin. One third of the mealtime dose should be given with each meal or less if the patient isn't eating much. And you can also add correction insulin dose to this. Patients receiving tube feeds can be particularly challenging to manage as these patients often have significant hyperglycemia. Patients receiving continuous tube feeds should be given a long acting basal insulin. And for mealtime insulin, they should receive regular insulin, about one unit for every 15 grams of carbohydrates in their tube feeds, divided every six hours, plus correction as needed. For bolus tube feeds, the calculations would be similar, but the mealtime insulin would be given at the start of each bolus tube feed. Hypoglycemia is a significant risk for hospitalized patients. They are often made NPO for procedures. They may have nausea or vomiting, which leads to decreased food intake. Patients on steroids may have their dose decreased, which may lead to lower insulin requirements. It is important to consider each of these scenarios and have contingency plans in place for each. If a patient is going to be NPO, one half the usual basal dose of insulin should be given. You should skip mealtime insulin, but can continue correction insulin for any hyperglycemia. If a patient is not eating all of their meals due to GI symptoms, it's reasonable to give the mealtime insulin after they eat and adjust the dose for the amount of food eaten. And as steroid doses are decreased, patients will need less insulin. This is covered in detail in the lesson on steroid-induced hyperglycemia. For hospitalized patients, it is important to avoid the complications of high blood sugars, but also important to recognize the risk of hypoglycemia and work to minimize the possibility of this by targeting blood sugars between 140 and 180 milligrams per deciliter for most hospitalized patients. So I hope you liked this video. Absolutely make sure to check out the course this video was taken from and to register for a free trial account which will give you access to selected chapters of the course. If you want to learn how MetMastery can help you become a great clinician, make sure to watch the About MetMastery video. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.